Welcome to the Biomin Seminar. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen from all around the world. My name is Neil Gannon and I'm the Regional Product Manager based in Asia for Gut Performance Products. I am pleased to host this evening's seminar. And just before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to give you a few housekeeping notices. You have all joined the presentation in mute only mode, so listen only mode and that will remain throughout the duration of the presentation. But please ask questions in the chat bar on the side and we will have a question session at the end of the presentation. During the presentation, we have three short polls. These are just to get some uh, feedback from you as to some of the issues that are facing. So please click promptly after you've read the questions on the polls. We will also share with you the presentation and a video link at the end of this presentation so that you can review the presentation and co make contact with Biomin staff if you have any further questions. At this stage, I would now like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker this evening is Pavel Scarlett. And Dr. Pavel Scarlett is part of the European Biomin technical sales team. And he joined Biomin in 2019. Pavel received his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree in 1999 and was followed by a PhD in Microbiology and Biotechnology in 2001. He also holds a Master of Asian Health and Medicine from the University of Melbourne. Pavel joined Biomin from a primary broiler breeder company where he'd been working for the last 14 years in different senior technical positions in Russia and Europe, and then as a company veterinarian for Turkey, Middle East and Africa providing poultry health support for the whole region. With experience in a wide range of production systems around the world, Dr. Scarlett has a deep understanding of both technical and veterinary sides of the poultry business. Pavel's professional interests include economics of bird health management, disease control in large poultry populations, and biosecurity practices in different climatic zones, and therefore an excellent speaker to talk to you today on the management of modern broiler breeders. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Scarlett. And Dr. Scarlett, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil, for this kind introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. And today we are going to talk about management of modern world breeders, of course. So we're going to cover in my talk the goals of uh, royal breeder farming and, of course, main challenges which we do see in the field are pretty much all over the world. So I'm going to talk about gut health and bird performance in general. We're going to cover the topics of toxidiosis and opportunistic gut microbiota control. And in the end, we will briefly touch the topic of metabolic disorders in modern breeds. So uh, let me bring you to the first poll question. The first poll question would sound, what is the main or most important goal in your breed operation. So on the screen, you will see the poll. Please select one of those answers. So the numbers are coming in quite quickly. Majority of people looking at higher egg production, better chick quality in number two. So I'll close the poll now. And the results, Pavel, are that 68% of the audience indicated that the most important goal in the breeder operation is higher egg production, hatchability, and chicks produced. 19% of the respondents indicated that better chick quality and less complaints was their most important factor. And then at about the same sort of numbers, 7%, uh, better growth, feed efficiency, and lower disease incidence and mortality. So very good feedback. Thank you for that. Back to you, Pavel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, for your answers. Uh, actually, that is exactly the truth because that's what majority of the farmers expect from the broader breeders. Of course, we want the maximum number of, of eggs, but these eggs not should be just X, they should be fertile X, and that with high catchability, and that would give us maximum or high number of chicks for broiler breeder. But of course, we want also to have 
are good quality chicks coming from prolabrators. They should be chicks with a minimum mortality, minimum cull rate. And of course, we want our breeders to be free from vertically transmitted diseases. On this slide, you can see briefly their target performance of uh, broiler breeders, which uh, uh, genetic companies are offering nowadays. So you can see that the total number of eggs is roughly about 185 as a target, and the uh, number of chicks are uh, roughly about 150, with 85.8, 86% hatchability, the peak of production. 86 percent uh, production lasts uh, roughly 25 weeks and uh, we have birds finishing our production cycle ideally with the body weight of four kilograms 4.2 are uh, with the mortality figures we expect our broiler breeders to have mortality and cull rate during rearing or growing period about four to five percent and mortality rate during lay about eight percent so these are the targets. Uh, how can we achieve them? Of course, there are a lot of factors affecting broiler breeder performance. And these are management. These are equipment which we are using. This is, of course, biosecurity, microclimate, different diseases, and, of course, nutrition. With some of them, we can impact our broiler breeders. With some of them, we cannot because they are just given to us. But uh, with the following slides, I'm going to talk how we can impact uh, and increased performance. A few words about genetics. If we talk about layers, their main genetic pressure and main genetic selection is done on the number of eggs. When we talk about broiler breeders, it is, of course, the neat yield of the further generation of the broiler generation, but also uh, genetic pressure or selection pressure is spread through the neat yield and number of eggs. And main uh, target for, for the selection for the genetics is to increase the need yield in the broiler generation. And that impacts the metabolism of those birds as well. That impacts the way they live, that impacts the way they lay eggs, that impacts the way they consume feed. If we look at the history of genetics, if we compare, let's say, 1957 year broiler coming back to 1957 to current broiler, we would find out that the meat yield, especially breast meat yield, increased significantly. Not only the meat yield, we know that their feed conversion rate improved, and uh, parameters like the general health of the broiler are also uh, improving, uh, in particular in regards to the resistance to metabolic disorders. So, but this uh, growth of broilers are not possible with the broiler breeders uh, because these genes and the uh, genetics of those broilers are coming from the mother hen and the father, of course, from parents. And these genes are coming from their breeded pair to the broilers. So it's important that we remember that when we grow our broiler breeders, because the way the broiler breeders gain their weight, the way they are utilize the feed is very similar to broilers. And if we compare, the body weight of broilers to body weight of breeders, we find out that, of course, broilers are growing much faster, but the breeders growing much uh, not as fast as broilers because we control the feeding of breeders. In general, they're consuming approximately one third of that feed, which they would have consumed if they fed ad libitum. And this is something we always need to remember because if the broiler breeder have any opportunity to utilize the feed, they will certainly grow, they will certainly utilize this seed, and they will certainly convert this seed into muscle. And this is something which is important, especially when we talk about production uh, period, when we talk about egg laying. So what uh, periods can the life of broiler breeder be divided into? These are two distinctive periods of life. The first one is a grow period or rearing period. That's a period when uh, uh, broiler breeders are growing their tissues, they are uh, reaching their sexual maturity, are reaching their physiological maturity. And then when we stimulate those birds into lay, they start laying eggs. And at that period, when the birds lay eggs, the growth pretty much stop, and uh, it's only weight increase due to the fat uh, accumulation happens. So all the development of important for us organs and tissues, uh, skeleton system, cardiovascular system, immune system, 
gastrointestinal tract, of course, and reproductive organs is happening during rearing period. And if something went wrong during this rearing period, it would be very difficult to change that during production period when the birds start laying eggs. For this reason, the importance of rearing period, on my opinion, is approximately about 70% of the whole bird life. Because if we did not achieve target, target weights, if we did not achieve required, required development of, of the organs and tissues during rearing, we cannot or change the birds during production period, so we would, uh, they would underperform, we would not achieve the required number of eggs, and thus would not achieve the required number of chicks. So what uh, periods does the rearing period consist of? And here, I would like to um, start from the very beginning, right after we place birds, we call this the brooding period, there is a very rapid development of immune system, cardiovascular system, feathering, and skeleton. That followed by the uh, dynamic growth of muscle, tendon, and ligaments. And uh, approximately at about nine to 10 weeks, uh, we do see that 95% uh, of the skeleton have already developed. And at that stage, it would be very difficult to change the size of the bird. You can change the body weight, of the bird, but you cannot change the size. And of course, that would impact the uniformity of the flock. Right after that, we do see the start of development of testes and ovaries. And if you look at the body weight on this period, you can see that there is acceler accelerated growth and weight gain coming right after 105 days into 160 days. And this growth of the body weight is related right at the growth of reproductive organs, the production first production of sex hormones, uh, a rapid development of ovaries, rapid development of testicles in males. And uh, at about 161 days, we do see beginning of sex sexual maturation. And again, it's very important that at this period, birds are following this rapid increase in the body weight, because if, we, if they are underfed or if they are underachieving nutrients or their gastrointestinal tract is compromised, and it would mean that it would be not enough proteins, carbohydrates, and fats to the formation of these important reproductive organs, which in future will impact our uh, production performance. So let's focus on the first period of life of the broiler breeder, which is a brooding period. And that starts right after the placement. Um, uh, of course, we want uh, the placement to be done in clean houses. We want to prepare those houses properly. We follow all the biosecurity requirements. We follow hygiene, we clean our houses, we prepare feed, we distribute feed, we prepare the lighting, and when we place our birds. When we place our birds, we want to achieve uh, the target that birds do not need to travel more than one meter to find feed and water. For this reason, we achieve the a good microclimate, we achieve their good water pressure, feed availability. And the judgment for placement of the bird would be crop fill. Crop fill is actually the assessment of how much feed birds consumed during these first hours, and in particular, first 24 hours, which are most important for us. So these three open chicks, they are two day old chicks, and they might look very similar to you, but if we look at the gastrointestinal tract of those chicks, we would find out that the length of the gastrointestinal tract is different, and not only the length. The first gastrointestinal tract shows you a chick which had a feed available at start, which was placed right at the feed. The second gastrointestinal tract shows you delayed feed access, and the third one shows that uh, that was a chick which didn't have access to the feed at all. So the first parameter is the length of the gastrointestinal tract, and this is the most important one because, of course, the length of the gastrointestinal tract would uh, determine the absorption of nutrients. But not only the length, you can also see that the yolk, residual egg yolk size is different. And uh, in the bird which had feed available at start, the size of the yolk is the smallest. And the bird which didn't have feed at all, we do see that the size of the yolk sac, residual yolk sac, is the largest. And this is also a very important parameter because all the lipids, all the nutrients from the mother hen coming to the chick through the residual yolk, not only feed, but also all the 
immunoglobulins, this, as we call this maternal immunity, all the immunoglobulins which mother hen is trying to pass to the progeny is going through the yolk sac. For this reason, it's very important. If we want to achieve the highest uh, number of maternal of uh, immunoglobulins coming from the mother to the brother, we want to achieve the maximum absorption of the yolk sac. And also, you might notice that the seeker in the bird, which didn't have access to the feed, is all, also a different color. It has a uh, uh, frothy material, there are some bubbles in the seeker, and that also shows you some uh, dysbiosis, the absence of the normal microbiota and uh, the, uh, some um, difficulty in the absorption and the utilization of the nutrients as well. But the changes are not only happening microscopically, they're also happening on the microscopic level. This slide shows you our villi's, gastrointestinal villi's, which gastrointestinal tract is lined with. And uh, to increase just the absorptive surface, the villi's, they are increasing absorptive surface approximately in 16 times. But each villi, each villi is covered with micro, micro villi. And these microvilli covering villi are increasing absorptive surface, surface nearly 40% in 40%. So these villi, they are responsible uh, for the passage of nutrients, for the passage of uh, carbohydrates, uh, fats, uh, uh, proteins through uh, the ciliated epithelia directly into the bloodstream. And the development of the gut and the length of villi is dependent very much on the availability of feed. In this slide, you can see that the delay access to the feed impacts the villi length measured at 24 and 48 hours. Not only villi length, but also villi surface. So with the birds delayed access to the feed, we do see much, uh, much uh, smaller surface of the villi, but also goblet cell numbers produced by villas. What goblet cells are doing, they are responsible for production of mucin, mucus. And this mucus, of course, first it's the moisture, the uh, chemus, the, uh, the content of the gastrointestinal tract, but also responsible for the passage of the nutrients from the chemos into ciliated epithelia, because that happens in the presence of water and birds do not have sal salivary glands at all. So what impacts the development of the gastrointestinal tract? Gastrointestinal tract starts developing very early. It starts developing at the last stage of incubation, as uh, early as 17 days. And uh, the poor gut tone at hatch before birds have consumed any feed might be related to the issues with the uh, uh, hatchery, in particular overheating in the hatchery. Right after the hedge, gut starts developing very rapidly. It starts to mature, especially during switching from the yolk nutrition to external feed. And uh, as you have seen from my previous slides, the sooner the birds consume feed, the easier they absorb residual yolk and the faster they would absorb residual yolk. Also, enzyme production begins at that time and the immune system starts to mature and develop. Microbiota starts to colonize gastrointestinal tract, and villi, gastrointestinal tract villi, are going on the rapid development, in particular in the first 10 days of chick life. So, for this reason, it's extremely important to organize these first days of chick life in the correct manner that there are no any stressors, that they always consuming feed and develop their gastrointestinal tract right from the beginning. So, <laughs> What role does microbiota play in the development of the gastrointestinal tract? <laughs> it first it promotes the development and maintenance of the gut tissues, and of course stimulates the development and maturation of the immune system. We call these organs um, gut-associated lymphoid organs. These are immune organs which are spread through the gastrointestinal tract and the presence of the gut microbiota stimulates the development of these organs thus by developing of immune organs protect chickens from the uh, challenges from the pathogenic microflora or pathogenic viruses and bacteria which they might meet in the future life and of course continuous stimulation of gut flora ensures the immune system 
is in a constant state of readiness and in, in the constant state of alertness. So microbiota also moderates the immune response, and in particular immune response in the gastrointestinal tract. It also produces anti-inflammatory effect and produces certain substances which can act as anti-inflammatory substances and assist in digestion and provides beneficial metabolites to the host, to the chicken. What other important roles of microbiota are, do we have this first? Microbiota offers protection from gut pathogens. And there are three main mechanisms how gut microbiota can do this. The first one would be competitive exclusion. So in this slide, you can see uh, bacteria attached to the ciliated epithelia, uh, one line of cells, with the presence of pathogenic bacteria. If we do see this normal uh, uh, representatives of the gastrointestinal tract attached to ciliated epithelia, pathogens, which are always present in the gastrointestinal tract, cannot attach, cannot attached to the ciliated epithelium. Another important method how gut microbiota can uh, offer protection is competition with pathogenic bacteria for nutrients. And of course, uh, all bacteria consume uh, nutrients through the lumen, from the lumen of gastrointestinal tract, good bacteria and bad bacteria. If we do have good bacteria in the presence or in the lumen of gastrointestinal tract, they would consume nutrients which otherwise would be available for the pathogenic bacteria. Thus, but the pathogenic bacteria would not proliferate, would not grow, and we would have much less pathogenic bacteria present. Plus to that, good normal microbiota, good representatives of the gastrointestinal tract microbiota would produce um, antimicrobial substances. They would produce bactericins, they would produce lactoferins, they would produce lysozymes, and uh, these natural substances, they would inhibit the growth of pathogenic bacteria. Also, good representatives of the normal gastrointestinal tract microbiota would produce organic acids, and they would lower the gastrointestinal tract pH, and by lowering gastrointestinal tract pH, this would, it would also impact the growth of pathogenic microbiota. So how can we make gut healthy? First of all, we need to seed healthy pioneering species as soon as possible into gastrointestinal tract. Ideally, it should be done uh, in the yolk or in the hatchery during incubation process. Unfortunately, we still do not have in over probiotics. I believe it's just a matter of time when they are available. But as soon as we place, up, place our chicks, we need to give them this good microbiota because the development of the chicken microbiota takes a few weeks to fully mature. And uh, the first colonization starts very early. The crop colonization starts within the first 24 hours. One day post hatch, we do see microbiota uh, colonizing ileum, seeker. And after three days, level of bacteria increases tenfold. So this is another reason why it's important that chicks after placement, right after placement, they need with good bacteria. Within two weeks, adult or in the uh, adult chicken, small intestine microbiota will be nearly established. And after 30 days, the sickle flora will be fully established in the, in the bird. To bring this all uh, concept into uh, a more understandable uh, story, I just show you an example of a forest right after a fire or a jungle right after a fire. Let's imagine we had a fire and we do have our gut uh, of a chick at the hedge when there is absolutely no microbiota or no any plants present. Fire just happened. Then we do see in the forest grasses appears, we do see moss appears, and that would be pioneering species in the gastrointestinal tract. These pioneering species would turn into succession species. And these succession species would, would, would mature into mature species. And in case of our gastrointestinal tract, they would stay in the gastrointestinal tract as long as they are there. Any stress of the gut system can slow the rate of succession. And it's important to remember that each time the gut is compromised, the gut flora can set back. 
and thus it requires re-establishment. So how to make the gut healthy? Of course, we want to avoid any kind of stimulation of harmful bacteria and microbiota, and we want to uh, avoid poor gut development, as have already been mentioned, during incubation and during brooding, uh, during brooding period, but also feed. Feed itself plays a very important role. Uh, the first place, of course, contamination with mycotoxins. We know that mycotoxins are able to irritate gastrointestinal tract. They have certain immunosuppression qualities. They are losing tight junction between these ciliated epithelia cells, thus allowing the leakage of the plasma into the lumen of gastrointestinal tract and penetration of toxic substances into the bloodstream. But also these things like improper feed form. Uh, nowadays, everybody wants to have a good pellet, good quality pellet. Good quality pellet comes with a very fine grinding because the smaller particles of the pellet, the easier they uh, attach to each other during the process of pelletization. And uh, these small particles, when they're present in the gastrointestinal tract, they are not stimulating the work of the gastrointestinal tract. They are not stimulating uh, proventriculus and gizzard. They are going quite fast through the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, they are not delaying that much as we want them. So we do see sometimes malabsorption, especially when they are, when the birds are fed with the diet uh, which have been grinded to the very fine particles. Another important things are ingredients. Uh, with early breeders, especially during the rearing period, when the birds are on the restrictive feeding, when they are consuming approximately 30% of what they could have consumed if they fed at libitum, we want to increase the volume of feed because otherwise they consume feed very quickly. And to increase the volume of feed without increasing the nutrient value, we nutritionists they add fiber. And of course, this fiber, if there's too much fiber, it delays the uh, passage of the chemus through gastrointestinal tract, and that can also impact the growth of microbiota, it can also impact uh, the functioning of the gastrointestinal tract. Antinutrients, trypsin inhibitors, uh, north touch polysaccharides, uh, uh, phytate or uh, disbalance in amino acids uh, components, this also plays a very important role. Infectious substances, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, are water quality, very important parameter. And in particular, we talk here about uh, presence of bacteria in water, water pH, water hardness, because that impacts how much bacteria does water contain, excess of salt and organic matter. Environment stressors, temperature, lighting, and of course, the stresses which birds experience through the rearing period. And of course, antibiotic treatment, which are also uh, quite common to see nowadays. So what does antibiotic treatment do? And here again, I will come back to the concept of forest. When we treat birds with antibiotics, we literally destroy the established bacterial community. When we destroy established already bacterial community, this community needs to be re-established. We also again need this uh, pioneering succession species. And this is done using direct fed microbials to restore the balance in the gastrointestinal tract. So what microbiota, what can happen during upset of the gut? And the first would be shift in microbiota. This is indicative for malabsorption. And uh, with the shift of microbiota, we do see poor fat absorption. We do see more nutrients, more sugars, more easy digestible carbohydrates, proteins available in the gastrointestinal tract in a seeker for utilization for pathogenic bacteria, and uh, that these are nutrients for the pathogenic bacteria. Pathogenic bacteria would utilize them. They would produce more, they would produce gases, they would produce carbon dioxide, they would produce ammonia, they, they would produce hydrogen sulfate, they would also produce toxic amines, that they would irritate gastrointestinal tract and cause growth depression. Bile acid inactivation might happen and you would see that would impact the fat absorption. So in general, that would lead to further digestive tract upset. And this digestive tract upset happens not only during the rearing stage, but also during 
production when roads are laying eggs. And here are, I need to talk about egg hygiene because the health of the gastrointestinal tract and the contents of the chemos is very important for the contamination of eggs because eggs are usually contaminated with feces. And if we look at the fresh egg, once it's laid and compare to the level of contamination of the dirty egg, we would see that the levels of contamination of the dirty egg is much, much higher. And of course, the more watery pieces that we have in a, in a, in a flock, more dirty are slots, more dirty is litter, and of course, more dirty are feet of the birds and more dirty are nests, and especially uh, inside a nest. So there is a direct correlation between the gut health and the egg uh, cleanliness and actual cleanliness. Thanks very so much, that, Pavel. That's an yeah, that's excellent introduction into the, the importance of establishing effective microbiota and some methodologies to how to do it. Um, I'd like to now launch a, a poll for the audience. Um, so in your opinion, which feed additives contribute most towards the establishment of beneficial gut microbiota? Is it probiotics and prebiotics? Is it organic acids? Is it phytogenics or is it antibiotics? You could all please uh, take a second to vote there. Um, early indication is that uh, probiotics and prebiotics are certainly uh, leading. I will uh, close the, the voting off now to keep the show rolling. And on the screen now you will see the results. So it's, it's quite clear that, uh, you know, the audience believe that the most important way of establishing beneficial gut microbiota is, is probiotics and prebiotics, but also organic acids and phytogenics uh, have a role, and antibiotics can also play a, a smaller role. So uh, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you very much, um, Edindis, for this um, for answering uh, this poll question. And again, uh, it's very important to underline here that good uh, bacteria, probiotics, prebiotics, they also need, uh, they also benefit from lowering down gastrointestinal tract uh, pH and in particular using of organic acids from this tract. So let's go uh, further. Now we are turning and switching to the second part, very important part of the rearing stage. This is skeleton and organs development which happens after brooding period and finishes approximately about nine to 10 weeks of life. So as I have mentioned by that time, uh, by the end of this period, skeleton is nearly, skeleton is formed and we cannot impact uh, the uh, size of the skeleton at that stage. To achieve the uniform skeleton development, we do a lot of, a lot of um, procedures with the birds with the main aim to achieve good flock uniformity. Why do we need good flock uniformity? Because uniform birds would react uh, to the uh, uh, procedures, to the uh, stimulations which we will apply to the flock more predicted way. There will be faster and more even response to the light stimulation. There will be better uniformity in hatching eggs, of course, thus better hatchability, less are delayed in the hedge, uh, shorter hedge window. Females will be more receptive for males, so there will be uniformity in the sexual maturation. There will also be improved hatchability, improved cheek quality, and better broiler performance, of course. How do we achieve good uniformity? With a lot of management techniques, we grade birds, we, uh, of course, uh, give them feed according to their body weight. We uh, sometimes light them differently. We delay light stimulation, but with the main target to achieve severe flock uniformity of eight to 10%. But when we feed those birds during rearing period, again, very important to remind you that these birds are not fed ad libitum. They are, they are always on restricted feeding. So they are always kind of hungry, if you wish. And there is an impact of this condition to the gastrointestinal tract as well. As uh, you already know, the gut is covered uh, with a single layer of cells, the ciliated epithelia, and this barrier prevents, normally prevents bacteria entering the body. During starvation, uh, villus, the tips are eroded, epithelia detaching from the valus pore, 
and this gives opportunity for bacteria to cross this gut barrier and penetrate to the bloodstream. So a loss of intestinal integrity can result in bacteria crossing the gut barrier. So on this slide, you can see that if we do have our normal uh, uh, line of uh, ciliated epithelia with a good tight junction between cells, with the presence of uh, microbiota, good and bad, in the gastrointestinal lumen, they cannot penetrate through this line of, of uh, cells to the bloodstream. If the tight junction are, is uh, uh, destroyed, pathogenic bacteria can penetrate through the tight junction to the bloodstream, and this can result into systemic disorders. It could uh, uh, result into the uh, different conditions and uh, arthritis, uh, bacteria, bacteremia, and uh, eventually a death of the birth. What also value of gut barrier can bring uh, when there is a dysfunction, gut becomes inflamed, and of course there is a increased risk for further disease. There is certainly a reduction in nutrient absorption, as already been mentioned. Uh, when we do see a reduction in nutrient absorption, these bacteria becomes available for, utiliz for utilization of pathogenic bacteria, but also if we do see disruption of tight junction, there is a leakage of plasma into the lumen of gastrointestinal tract, and this plasma can also be utilized by pathogenic bacteria. Or let's better call them opportunistic bacteria because they always would present in the lumen of gastrointestinal tract, but they would use an opportunity, this opportunity to produce pathogenic conditions. These bacteria are Clostridia perfringens, Enterococcus sicorum, even E. coli, some strains, they will proliferate and uh, produce necrotic enteritis, spondylolisthesis, uh, aviopertinitis, uh, bacterial chondronecrosis, uh, osteomyelitis, and different conditions. And of course, when bacterial toxins can uh, penetrate to the bloodstream, uh, they, this would cause a to toxic shock in multiple organs of the body. So what other management procedures do we have in rearing? Stressful management procedures, I would say this would be, of course, grading, very stressful procedure. Of course, grows are handled. We want to minimize these stresses as uh, much as possible. Weighing birds weekly, we should weigh not less than 5% of females to no exact body weight of the flock. And of course, vaccinations, because when we vaccinate birds, majority of the vaccines are given during rearing time before they lay because vaccination itself is a very stressful procedure we want these birds don't lay eggs when we give them vaccines plus to that we vaccinate them in rearing because some vaccines are given for uh especially for females for this maternal immunity that these antibodies are passed from the mother hen to the progeny to the broiler progeny through this egg yolk so we want them to have very high, very uniform level of antibodies to certain diseases before they come into lay. One of these uh, diseases is toxin, coccidiosis. And uh, when we talk about coccidiosis, it's important to say that this is one of the most probably common enteric disease and disorders in poultry and in broiler breeders as well. What is the vaccine against coxy? This is light attenuated uh, bacteria species or uh, emeria species. And um, what is vaccination? Vaccination is a controlled pathogen exposure. Up to now, we do not have any killed vaccines against coxy available. So when we vaccinate birds, these light emeria species, they multiply in the gastrointestinal tract, they multiply controlled way, and they cause certain level of the damage. It might not be visible, but it happens. And uh, this is multiple damage because we want to achieve uh, circulation. That impairs the function of the gastrointestinal tract and increases the risk for further diseases. I just want to show you some pictures of the clinical coccidiosis. These are epithelia, ciliated epithelia, villites. These are uh, penetration of sporulated oocysts into villites. And here you can see the multiplication uh, of the uh, Coxy in the villi, we go through two uh, asexual and one sexual cycles. And in the end, we do see that 
destruction. In case of, in case of clinical coccidiosis, we do see a disruption of the villi. We do see uh, detachment of the tip of the villi. And of course, the decrease of the absor absorptive capacity. So in the end, we do see the uh, destruction of the gastrointestinal tract lining. So this slide shows you a microscopic picture of the normal gastrointestinal tract and infected with coccidiosis. We do see here very clearly atrophy of the villi, hyperplasia of crypts. And I want again to underline the importance of the early gut development because the longer villi uh, develop before the birds are vaccinated with coxy vaccine, the less stressful would be this vaccination. So for this reason, it's very important that the uh, early growth of the villi and the uh, availability of the feed and good microbiota and organic acids are beginning right from the bird placement. So another condition which usually follows coccidiosis challenge, uh, this is clostridial or uh, clostridial perfringence challenge, uh, uh, opportunistic microbiota, which always present in the gastrointestinal tract and in certain conditions is able to cause necrotic enteritis, but everything starts with CD infection, uh, there is a intestinal damage. Damaged uh, intestine, uh, they're trying to defend it, uh, themselves. It's uh, going to immune response, cell mediated immune response. Um, T cells are uh, released cytokines, they have produced interferons. These cytokines and interferon, they are uh, activate mutin gene in goblet cells. Yeah, and of course, we have already talked about that, that uh, goblet cells produce mucin, they produce mucus, and this mucus becomes a feed for Clostridia perfringens because Clostridia have uh, mucolytic enzymes, they produce them. So they start multiplying very rapidly, utilizing this mucus. About By multiplying very rapidly, the number of Clostridia increases. But it's not the clostridia which damages the gastrointestinal tract, but the alpha toxin which, which clostridia produces. So with the increased number of clostridia, we do see increase of alpha toxin. And again, this alpha toxin damages the gastrointestinal tract again, and again, uh, the mucus is produced. So it's kind of a vicious circle. So again, to stop this condition, we need to control coxidiosis. We need to control the to arrange vaccination, coxidiosis vaccination in the uh, least stressful way. So for this reason, we need a good development of the gastrointestinal tract. In the end of a uh, rearing period, birds are transferred into production. Usually it's a transfer in a new house. And this, again, a very, very stressful procedure, not only because birds are handled, they are uh, caught into uh, transfer boxes, but also because they are placed in the new environment. Sometimes they have to adapt to new new feeding system, new drinking system. They find they need to find their place. They need to find a nest. And uh, this uh, at this stage, birds are moving into play. So that takes us to the short poll question. Yes, yeah, thanks, Pavel. Again, another excellent introduction into some of the, the common operational problems that, that our customers um, on this uh, webinar could be listening, could be hearing, or experiencing rather. Um, with a, a, such a universal audience, I just want to now poll the audience and find out, you know, what is the most important problem that's encountered in your breeder operation? Is it growth and uniformity during rearing period? Egg production and egg quality issues? Metabolic disorders? or pathogenic disease. So I'll close the uh, poll off now. And the results are on your screen now. And you can see that uh, growth and uniformity during the rearing period um, appears to be the, the biggest uh, challenge. Um, but all those other ones are also uh, very common. So, and I suspect that there's probably also multiple uh, issues there. So uh, yeah. Thanks, Pavel. I guess you can take that information and uh, uh, come home with the, the last few slides for the presentation. Thank you very much, Neil. And um, uh, fully agree, growth in the new comedy is very important. And my uh, further slides would cover that topic. So we are going to talk about two 
are probably most often met metabolic disorders or conditions, which we do see nowadays in modern broiler breeders. This is progressive overposition and defective egg syndrome and the sudden death syndrome. And both conditions are actually very much related to the flock uniformity and uh, in particular, and uh, but they both start from uh, what we call overfeeding complex. Because again, I want to remind you that these birds, they are carrying these fast growing genes. They are carrying these genes of fast uh, gaining breast muscle, um, meat gaining weight uh, genes. So it's very, very important that we always remember that when we manage these birds. So there are two conditions. The first one is related to excessive follicle development due to overfeeding complex and poor uniform flow. And the second one is related to excess muscle development. So what happens in the case of first one, we all know normal ovarian morphology. We do have stroma and we do have five to eight uh, ovaries of uh, size larger than one centimeter. Uh, but in case of excessive follicle development, we do see multiple follicle hierarchy. We do see sometimes two or three uh, follicles of the same size developed at the same time. And probably the most common condition which you have seen in this case is a double yolk X. This is exactly happening when these two follicles of the same size are coming into one eggshell and they end up as one double yolk X. Uh, this condition always present in every flock. It's a matter of question how much do we have of those double yolk X. And in particular, if we do see immature birds, young birds, birds which doesn't have enough pinborn distance or overweight birds, birds with too much fat, we do see condition which we call prolapse. That's exactly when after egg is laid, we do see reproductive organs stay away, they stay too long, that attracts attention on other birds and they start pecking. So we are losing birds right in the beginning of production due to pecking without any obvious uh, infectious reasons. Another condition, second condition, which uh, erratic uh, overposition can cause is internal of a, internal overposition. That happens when, again, two follicles of the same size are developed at the same time. One follicles end up in the infundibulum and in the oviduct as a net, and the second one stays inside abdominal cavity. And again, accumulation of these eggs in the abdominal cavity becomes an ideal media for bacteria multiplication. So bacteria will utilize these eggs, they would utilize this yolk mass to grow, and uh, that would end up in egg yolk peritonitis. The third, con the third uh, uh, condition which might end up are from uh, erratic position would be oviduct infection. That's again when two follicles of the same size are developed at the same time. They both go in, into infundibulum. Sometimes they do not go through the oviduct. They stay inside oviduct and again gets infected. And we do see a oviduct infection. All these conditions lead to egg yolk peritonitis. And, that, and that's what we see most often during our stimulation of immature flock or in ununiform flock into lay and that's when we lose sometimes quite a large number percent of birds are uh, when we have already brought them into lay so we lose them right in the beginning of production you might wonder uh, how e coli which is usually a causative agent of peritonitis comes into abdominal cavity and here i want to remind you that abdominal cavity is not always a sterile environment e coli is, is an ubiquitous in the environment first then we do have abdominal air sacs. And if we do have problems with microclimate, dusty air in the chicken shed, this dust carries a lot of pathogenic bacteria, including E. coli, and that goes directly into abdominal cavity. Plus to that constant ascending of E. coli from cloaca and also uh, leaky gastrointestinal tract, E. coli can go through from the gastrointestinal tract into the bloodstream. So what are management strategies to minimize egg yolk peritonitis due to this erratic position? Of course, first will be keeping flock uniform during the rearing period and avoid overfeeding. Uh, plus to that, we want to keep good microclimate. 
good drinking water management, good intestinal health, and as a last resort, we want to go into medication or vaccinations against Ebola. The second condition, which also quite common to see, is excessive muscle development. And this brings us to this refeeding or sudden death syndrome, which is also quite common to see. And uh, the first condition was uh, noticed uh, in the prisoners of war after uh, people they were starved and then they were aggressively refed. Uh, the doctors they saw mortality with neurological signs that relates to the changes in electrolyte balance and in particular phosphorus and calcium balance. Oh, sorry, phosphorus and potassium balance. So in birds, uh, the pathogenicity of this condition again related to uniformity. Of course, we want our flock to be uniform. We want CV not more than 8 to 10 at point of play, but we always have ideal birds and small percentage of overfed birds and small percentage of underfed birds. If we could, we want to delay light stimulation for these birds. We want to let them a couple of weeks more to gain their muscle, to achieve their target weights, but sometimes it's not possible. And when these birds are underfed birds with poor muscle development are lighted, they gain muscle mass very, very rapidly because, again, they carry these uh, genes of rollers uh, and then they gain muscle mass. When they gain muscle mass fast, aggressively, there is increase of body weight. Plus to that, there is increase of the heart muscle. The increase of the heart muscle requires high demand for uh, phosphorus and potassium. But at that stage, they are usually fed pre-breeder or breeder one diet, which rich in calcium. And calcium impacts the absorption of phosphorus. So they do see a uh, lack of phosphorus, uh, lack of potassium, and increase of calcium. That ends up in the disruption of the passage of electrolyte signals and heart failure. Usually with this look, you would see uh, uh, mortality early in the morning and uh, at necropsy, you would see thickening of left, left ventricle wall or right ventricle dilatation, right? Like on this slide. So what's the uh, management strategy to control this? You can, you can give to those birds uh, uh, potassium, uh, carbonate, potassium chloride, but it's very important to remember that for all metabolic conditions, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. First of all, good flock uniformity. If your flock is uniform, if your CV is good, and if you stimulate birds at lay with, uh, which are uniform, you would have much less probability of metabolic disorders. You also need to follow your breed body weight profile, you want to avoid overfeeding during coming into lay, especially after light stimulation, adjust feed allocations from onset of peak to production, and maintain recommended diet and mineral supply. And in the, in the last case of refeeding syndrome, uh, in particular, potassium and uh, phosphorus. So with this slide, let me bring my uh, presentation to conclusion. I want to remind you again that current advantages seen in broadly genetic progress pose more challenges for those involved in managing broadly breeders. And this trend to continue in future, we always need to remember this. The easier broilers are managed, it will be more difficult to manage breeders. Placement, brooding, and early gut development is extremely important for breeder flock health and future production performance. So we need to achieve early development as uh, early gut development right from the placement. Good breeder flock uniformity at point of play is vital for best livability and maximum chick numbers. So uniformity, uniformity, uniformity again. And of course, managing more, more than broiler breeders requires attention to details and constant fine tunings in breeder management, in breeder health and breeder nutrition. Uh, with this slide, let me finish. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm open to your questions.
Thank you very much, Pavel. That's an excellent overview of um, modern broiler breeder management. Uh, we've got a lot of questions come through on the on the question box, so I'll, I'll summarise some of those um, to try and help us get through. A lot of them are on management. Uh, for the questions that we get, don't get through, we do have uh, you as the uh, delegates, your, your email, and a biomed representative will get back to you to help with those questions. But, but some of the questions that um, came about were to do with um, management, and I guess the best recommendation is to follow your uh, breeder guidebook or the flock that you have, uh, because I guess with our universal audience tonight, we've got people from the UK through to Asia, South Africa, there's not one standard recommendation for everything. But uh, any any tips on just general management of the, the breeder flock? Well, uh, the general management would be try to follow your uh, breeder supply guidelines. Uh, all the breeder recommendations are there for reason, especially in regards to body weight, in regards to nutritional specifications. All the recommendations with technical managers are given to uh, broiler breeder managers. They are uh, they probably are driven by experience of managers. They are driven by experience of other farms, and uh, they are are usually here, of course, to help you achieve the maximum. Uh, performance from your breed. Okay, um, a couple of questions which I'll group into to one about the you know management of the very early chick, the first few days of life, and um, I guess one of the first one is what is some of the, the tips for managing uh, birds that um, have travelled a long way and might get placed at day three of age? Um, how best do you uh, do you manage those ones? Well, there are no uh, secrets here. You want to create for these birds. The most comfortable environment at placement because these birds have traveled a lot probably you already see a delay in the absorption of the residual yolk so you want to give them feed and water access as soon as possible if you decide to vaccinate those birds on arrival please do not delay this procedure don't keep those birds in boxes let them uh, to the floor if there's floor immediately let them access to the feed and water and again, I want to remind this rule that uh, when we place our birds, we want that birds do not need to travel less than one meter to get access of the feed and water. Of course, for broiler breeders, I highly recommend to use additional feeders, additional drinkers, to get easier access to feed and water. And uh, of course, uh, to colonize the gut with the beneficial bacteria, you need to use uh, probiotics or uh, uh, substances with their normal representatives of the gastrointestinal tract microbi microbiota. And a similar sort of question in terms of um, it's very common practice in the field to use antibiotics for the first five days um, and the value of the broiler breeders would, would support that. What, what are your thoughts about uh, use of antibiotics in the first five days? Uh, antibiotics, of course, you we all know that our uh, and I believe you have learned that from my presentation, that my antibiotics destroy gastrointestinal tract microbiota. Not only that, they delay colonization of gastrointestinal tract with uh, good beneficial bacteria. An application of antibiotic would certainly delay of colonization. And in some situations, it might cause proliferation and growth of pathogenic bacteria as well, especially after you stop giving antibiotics, you might end up with dysbiosis and it would be much, much more difficult and it would take much longer time to reestablish normal microbiota after you treated birds with antibiotics. Plus to that, some antibiotics, certain antibiotics, especially systemic antibiotics, they can damage development of other tissues, not gastrointestinal tract in particular. They can damage the growth of cartilage. They can damage the growth of ligaments, and that can impact future problems with lamina. That can impact future problems related to laminas, and you might see problems with the lack of health in the future. Okay, unfortunately, time is running out. We have one more combined sort of question. It's around, you mentioned the role of coccidiosis uh, in, in uniformity and things, and just a, some comments around uh, use of day-old coxy vaccination, and then moving into, if you can't get day-old coxy vaccination at the hatchery, uh, what would be the best anti-coccidial program in the growing stage? 
in, and in terms of what is a, a sustainable solution over chemical or synthetic anticoxidials. Do you have any comments around well, COXI programs? And ideally, you want to vaccinate doors with Pixidiosis vaccine because Pixidiosis vaccine will uh, give you a level of protection, so a level of protection against all amyra species which present in the vaccine. And if you treat doors with uh, oxy anticoxidial pro products, it might not give you protection against all species. And of course, when you vaccinate doors, uh, you want to vaccinate them the least stressful way, that there is no any disruption to the gastrointestinal tract uh, and there is no damage to the uh, ciliated epithelia or minimum damage to ciliated epithelia. So for this reason, if you can, you are usually give a uh, vaccine at the time when the ciliated epithelia have already started developing, when you have already grew up all these D lights, uh, and then you vaccinate the birds. Thank you. All right, I would like now to, to thank you again, Pavel, for your presentation. I would also like to thank the, the support crew in the background that made this possible, Karina, Justin, Veron, Esther. Um, and thank you all for the audience. I really appreciate you giving up your time, uh, whether it's morning, evening. Um, Bye, and person will be in contact uh, with you if you have questions. Uh, when I close this down, there will be a Biomin survey um, and appreciate if you could fill that in so we could deliver some more useful uh, programs to you to, to help you with your common problems. So on that note, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the speakers. Wish you a safe um, journey with your broiler breeders and all the best under these difficult times. Thank you very thank much you for very your much. attention. Thank you. Bye-bye.